All right, so Megan, we're sitting here with Casey Comer. I, I, it's professional athlete, right? You yep. are a pro? <laughs> yep. Isn't that cool? Like, <laughs> when you're a kid, you're like, yeah, I want to be a professional athlete. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It seems kind of surreal. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. All right, so take us back <laughs> to, to childhood. Um, was this always the dream? Like, did you grow up being a runner? Were you coming to a family of runners? Well, not exactly. I mean, we started doing like the mile run in like third grade, mm -hmm. I think. And that was the first time I realized I was like pretty good at running. Did you just go out and school everyone? Yeah, it should be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, w I was pretty good. Yeah, I think in fifth grade, I set the school record around like 601 in the mile. Whoa. And that was the first time I was like, oh, that was pretty legit. I mean, it was, and it's just fun to win. Like, it's fun to compete. I also give credit to like, starting to really enjoy running because I had a friend in elementary school went to private school he would always get home before me and be waiting to like hang out in the yard and my <laughs> house was downhill from my elementary school so I would hand my book bag to my mom she'd walk up to pick me up from school and run down the hill to get home and play with my friends so I started doing that like five times a week so I mean I was putting in decent mileage in elementary school I guess without realizing it well it's kind of crazy most people you hear they played a different sport and then found track or they weren't good at anything and <laughs> right we went right. into track because yeah it, it, so yours you always knew you kind of wanted to to be in track no not, not really i played soccer mostly growing up through my freshman year of high school i actually played my freshman year of high school instead of running cross country until eventually i was convinced that i would just be much better at running than i was in soccer um so i played soccer and baseball and i think a lot of the reason why i ended up leaving those sports and coming over to running is because I, I kind of grew late. I was pretty good in baseball. Like I was the first kid who knew how to throw, throw a cutter, like an off speed pitch. And mm -hmm. so I was pretty good when I was like 10, 11 years old. Then as kids started growing Catching and getting bigger, <laughs> all of a sudden I couldn't throw as hard. I wasn't that great of a hitter. Like I was a little bit scared of the ball. Uh, even in soccer, I was getting pushed around a little bit. I mean, trying to toughen up and, and play. And I enjoyed being on those teams with my friends. But what part yeah. of the country was this? Uh, I'm from just outside of Philadelphia. So like okay, two so hours north of here. It's not that involved. much different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like by the time I was, you know, 14, I was getting frustrated because I left middle school when I was barely five foot tall. Um, I think things would have been different because I'm like six one now. If I have. That's interesting. When did the growth spurt happen? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> I pretty much grew three inches a year in high school. So that's amazing. Whoa. Yeah. So like that in running it was really going from my sophomore to my junior year where I ran like 17, 10 or something as a sophomore. And then I ran like 15, 35 in cross country. Oh, wow. Uh, my junior year. So that was my kind of big jump. But yeah, I grew throughout high school and even grew a little bit my freshman year of college. So, so were you almost short when you were in middle school? Oh, I was really short. Yeah, there were girls towering over me. <laughs> middle school was a terrifying uh, time. Okay, really. so like, this, a, a <laughs> personal note. So I have one son who is who's uh, I guess he's fourteen now. Yeah, and he is six foot one or two. Yeah, wow. And then his little brother hasn't grown for a while. He's in middle school, and he's probably I, I don't he's maybe cleared four feet. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm like yeah. I'm like it, you it could, could still, still happen. happen. Yeah. yeah, I legitimately I think I was just over five feet and ninety three pounds at the end of eighth grade. Okay, that's probably where he is. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your diet? <laughs> <laughs> My diet in yeah. middle school? Yeah, did, did you change it in high school? Yeah, I, like I mean, it definitely got better through middle school and high school. In elementary school, I was eating like Eggo waffles, bacon, mini donuts, like every morning yeah. for breakfast. I feel like at that point. My parents were like, you just need to eat. Like, you, yeah. you can eat whatever you want. It's fine. Uh, and as I started to kind of learn more about being an athlete, and especially towards those later years of high school, I actually started thinking about my diet a little bit more. But, I mean, I still ate the same lunch every day, like peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a couple of cookies. My mom packed me an apple. So carbs. Snack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the most important thing is you're just fueling. Like yeah. getting, even now, I always say I think more about eating enough eating the things I need to eat, then avoiding going to be more licks. All the, like, you know, I, I don't mind, you know, going out for a treat. Yeah, for people like who don't that. know what be more licks is, it is maybe the best ice cream. Oh, yeah. Uh, place in Baltimore, right by Patterson Park, where you guys do a lot of workouts. But mm -hmm. before we get there, so after high school, 
you figured out, okay, running is where I'm supposed to be. Cross country, you're starting to drop some numbers that are respectable. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, college. Yeah, so I think that big jump my junior year is like, that's the first time I really started to think about running in college. I don't even know that it crossed my mind before then. But my high school coach uh, was a good runner at JMU. He actually ran at JMU briefly with uh, Mike Smith, the NAU coach. Okay. So I thought that was interesting. But he taught me what a long run was. He taught me a lot about, you know, these things that need that you need to get ready for the next level and kind of helped me with the recruiting process too. And then I started looking at schools and eventually I chose Villanova, which is just outside Philadelphia, pretty close to staying home where I'm from. Yeah. And I think what really got me there is I went, uh, Marcus, my college coach had a summer camp called running works, which Brandon and I actually met there one time. That's crazy. And he was, I could tell was really interested. He came out to watch me at a dual meet, just racing another school when I got smoked by one of my rivals <laughs> in high school. And I think that we just had a really close relationship and that's what made me end up going there. You know, the more we interview people, the more I realize what a role the coaches have yeah. and the people that are passionate about running mm -hmm. it, for these kids that are in high school or even junior high, that they set them up with a positive feeling towards the sport that carries through like, I'm assuming you still think back to every once in a while you're doing a workout or something. You're like, oh, that's what he's talking about. Or, oh, yeah. I have, uh, there are dozens of Marcus quotes I could rattle <laughs> off or random stories or meetings we had in his office where he's scribbling on a piece of paper and you look back at the end of a 30 minute meeting and you can't make sense of anything that is written <laughs> down. But yeah, I think he was just such a great coach and mentor for me in college because he just taught me a lot about life and he had just been through everything that I was going through and had great perspective. Um, yeah, and I still reach out to him. And now my coach, Corey, kind of plays a different role because I'm later in my running career. He looks out for me in other ways too, which I'm thankful for. And yeah, like I said, high school, college, professional, I feel like I've always been so blessed to have the right people looking out for me in the sport. So what and was competing at Villanova like? I redshirted my freshman year. And then it was kind of similar. Like, it took me a couple of years to really get going. And then my junior year, redshirt sophomore year, there was kind of a big moment where I was the alternate for the DMR Nationals. And our anchor leg, who's one of my good friends, Logan Wetzel, he, like, pulled a hammy or something, and I had to step in. And I was terrified. Like <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. I, like, the, the nervousness, uh, the pre-race jitters, the going up. And, and these are people in their prime. This is You're seeing, like prime athletes lining yeah. up it's got to be like a scary thing to step out on the track yeah i like i step in and run anchor leg and basically marcus was like if we can just be top eight and be all american like that's good we just need to kind of hang in there but i'm looking at the guys lining up next to me on this anchor leg it's neil Gurley, who's an under armor guy now he's running 349 josh kerr grant fisher there there were a couple other guys i think ollie Hoare was in there too like wow. there were just it was star studded and basically I got dusted by a bunch of those guys, but hung on for eighth. So we got, uh, wow. we got yeah. a little all American honors <laughs> yeah. and walked away happy. And, uh, then that spring we went and we won two pen relays titles, which was huge. That's still my favorite meet in the world. I think it's I just such a say, special, I've never been to pen rate relays and, uh, coach Bennett, uh, at, like in one of his, I don't know if it was in a book or something he did, or if it was just in a lecture, but he was like, there's something special about pen relays and um why is it such a why is it so iconic so the big thing about pen i think the reason why the crowd is so electric and all is because basically half the country of jamaica shows up <laughs> and the mo the most exciting races are like the four by one the four by four because all the jamaican high schools like all the great jamaican high schools are racing each other and it's basically the best american high schools and the best jamaican high schools all in the same race the Jamaican flags all over the stands, there's Jamaican food in the stadium and all. And what made it special even more so for me coming from Villanova is like Villanova goes to Penn Relays every year. We hop on the train and go down as part of the tradition. And so I'm going to the start line, especially we won two titles that year, one Saturday and one Sunday, I think, or Friday, Saturday. Uh Going to the starting line, like even people coming from Jamaica recognize Villanova because they see it every year. Yeah, wow. And it's like an annual pilgrimage for some people from Jamaica to come up and see Penn Relays in this like big historic stadium. And I think it's the biggest track meet in 
you know, a non-Olympic year. Like, it's a huge, huge event. So, Do you still go and spectate now? Yeah, I mean, I would love to. It's just tough with the professional schedule since it's in April. Like, I'll be away at an altitude camp that we're doing or racing at Drake Relays. Like, I will definitely be going back eventually, and there's a big Villanova fan section that I'll sit with. Um, But I'm not going to be able to do it this year, unfortunately. What did you study while you were there? I was marketing and business analytics. Okay. That's what my master's is in. But you knew um, after you graduated, like, professional running was what you wanted to do? So at, that year after the Penn Relays titles, like, I struggled a little bit in the spring, but then I came back and I was second indoors in the mile. And that kind of is the first thing that got me thinking, maybe there is an opportunity. But I on and off struggled that year when COVID shut things down. I'd gotten hand, foot, and mouth in the fall so no. that really was how did tough. you do that <laughs> i i wish i i ha- honestly i have no clue but it was it sucked like i that really took its toll on me and then um came back the next year and was able to run 337 just snuck into the olympic trials like i'm talking i was not in there the field is 30 or whatever i'm like the, the 31st mouth. guy i'm yeah <laughs> that was the year before i was all right by then I'm pacing around the house a few days before because I need scratches to get in, mm. right? So the 800 happens, and, like, I think Donovan Brazier, like, was clearly hurt. Like, he didn't run well, and, like, he was clearly going to scratch. So I'm waiting on the scratch, and my agent now, Ray Flynn, who represented him, actually asked him, like, are you going to run? And he ended up scratching. Got a last-minute flight to Eugene. Got oh, to compete wow. there. You know, we never mentioned uh, what your distance is. Yeah, 1500 mile would be my uh, which main is a, I, yeah. I feel like the 1500 I don't understand why there's a 1500 <laughs> like is it just to appease the metric people because it just seems like you're so close to a mile why not throw in that extra hundred you know it's interesting I think the, there's a good case for running the mile indoors and the 1500 outdoors just because starting on the straight allows everybody to get in position and rather than going straight into a turn and people kind of bottlenecking and cutting each other off, it allows the race to kind of play out more safely, I guess more. It's more, it's just more efficient, I suppose. And then you get that excitement of the mile indoors, at least in college and the NCAA, it's still at the world stage. I think of 1500, uh, like at indoor world is more important to people. Yeah. I mean, most places around the world, like, there's like the sub four mile and all, which is marketable. Right. That's like something people think of, but they don't use miles. Like they don't. But that's a weird thing. So when I think about like running milestones and yeah. make, you're probably the same way. It's a mile, the 5K, which we jump from miles to now Ks. Yep. 10K, mm-hmm. half marathon, go back to miles. Yeah. yeah. Marathon, you know, and miles. then ultra marathon. But like, uh, I guess if I was to think about track 200, probably one of my favorite, I, I think that the 100 mm-hmm. and 200 are just so explosive. And that to me, isn't the same sport that I do. Like, yeah, I run and even most of the track stuff that I see you guys do. It's, it's a foreign sport to like someone who is like, I am who likes to marathon train or maybe, you know, my short distance is a 5k mm-hmm. that stuff. Like, cause you guys are going like red line the whole time. Yeah, and it's almost appropriate that you switch between the 1500 and the mile, like, for me, because it is in between that, you know, explosive sport where, you know, you need to be a really powerful athlete to the long endurance type of running that you get at, you know, 10K half marathon. So, yeah, you could argue that that's the perfect place for it to kind of be in between. So with that, your next step is if you felt like you were – I, I hate. I don't want to put down people who go longer and further, but it does seem like as you can't keep up with the shorter distances, you move to longer distances. So, like the next top for you would be maybe the five k. Well, or fifty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I'd love to run a five k this after season. Five thousand. I think. I think <laughs> in May, if I can get into one, I'll try to go out to LA and run mm-hmm. one at the USA TF Distance Classic. Uh, we'll see. But I think that that's only somewhat true. As you get older, a lot of times, maybe you don't feel like you have that speed to keep up, but you know, you've spent more time building that aerobic engine, which can take years and years and years to, you know, build up to the point where you can be competitive at the marathon distance. Like think about all your great 
marathoners like Kipchoge right now. Yeah. I watch videos of him like in Osaka competing against El Garouge and Bekele, Bernard Lagat. Like those guys have been through, you know, that space the too. Cycle, the great, yeah. great women as well. It's it's just part of the process of a career. I think the marathon just lends itself to being something that you progress to later in your career. It is interesting to me though. Like I don't. I think you can. Maybe people don't try it, but you could not have a track background. You could start running, especially I see it in the women's side of uh, marathoning. Mm -hmm. You could be wait till your late twenties, start running, and before you know it, you're at OTQ time <laughs> to yeah. to. To compete, maybe you're not going to beat Des Linden or, um, you know, who else would be up there? Kira D'Amato. Uh, Sarah Hall, Emma yeah, Bates. Emma, all, yeah. all those women. Maybe you're not quite at that 220 to, you know, uh, 19. 219 uh, speed yet, but you can get into Olympic qualifications. But I, I look on the men's side, and it's almost every men's marathon, the difference between a maybe the, uh, you see a lot of guys who can run like 220, you know, maybe breaking into the two teens but when you get down to that 209 208 they're all track guys they all eventually were in the track and that seems fair yeah i, would, I guess you have to say the same thing about the women too though but i guess to your point it's building that engine yeah and i think that people give super shoes a lot of credit for the improvements in like running and times worldwide, but also a better understanding of training. And I think like system-based training, like understanding how to build aerobic base, like how to properly train threshold and get as much out of that as you can. The need for, you know, VO two work and like speed work to get all these things working together to build the best athlete possible that you can be. We understand so much more about that now than we did, you know, a while back. That's why you're seeing so much deeper, like, fields age. in these big races. But you see people age ranges. like age yeah. ranges. That's where I don't think. Well, I, it, it is partly, I think it's a combo. The shoes that we're running in now aren't as hard on your body as the flats were. Mm -hmm. To run 26.2 in a, you know, 10 millimeters of, of hard mm -hmm. EVA versus now having 40 millimeter stack of, you know, super foams. You're, it's going to be easier on your body. But also, I think we are more concerned with nutrition, sleep, stretching, and the other stuff that goes along with it. But I don't know. Um, so you now are running. and Wait, I wanna, I'm curious about the transition from college to pro. Yeah, like, that's that. <laughs> what resources does like a Villanova give you, if any, or how do you figure that out as a college athlete? Well, yeah. Um, we had a really nice space with like a, like our own kind of weight area and, you know, obviously I had great coaches, places to train. I think that some of the things that I never could have gotten there that I get now, one thing that I think of is I sleep in an altitude tent. I don't know if you guys have, yeah. uh, are familiar, but we, uh, yeah, it, so. I mean, I'm familiar with it before this, but if wait, like every night. Uh, I do, I do like stints in it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely take to. a break from it in the off season. But like, yeah, like right now, I'm doing kind of a month in it to prepare then for altitude camp. I'll be more ready for that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I try to, I try to sleep in it as often as I can, especially during the season. Are you not to that part in Kara Goucher's book? No, but I mean, I know yeah. like all I've read yeah. all about it, and we seen, had a friend who was using yeah. one yeah. as an amateur, uh, not even as a pro. But yeah, yeah. I actually offered to lend it to a friend while I'm away at camp. I was like, I mean, it's a little weird, but I guess you can try it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, mine is so. There's the one that's just like a box that like goes here, and you just like put it over yeah. your head. Ugh. Mine is actually goes over a full queen size bed, nice. so it takes like an hour to like get up to altitude, and then like you go in, and it's got a little fan that regulates. I can control it from my phone. Now uh, it's got to get hot in there. Yeah, in the summer, I have a little fan hanging from the top that I, like, spin. And my room is actually in the basement, so it's kind of better uh, for me. Yeah, uh, have you heard of Ullers? No. Okay, maybe you need to talk to Under Armour and get these, get them to pay for them because they're not cheap. But it's an air-conditioned bed, basically. So you put this over the top of your mattress. It has, like, cooling, like, tubes. Wow. And then it runs, refrigerates water and runs it through your... And if I had an altitude tent, there's no way that I wouldn't have <laughs> the hula there. Does it feel hard to breathe in there? Like, do you feel it? Uh, so you got to take 
for anybody who's using an altitude 10 for the first time who may be listening to this, uh, <laughs> you, you, like what I do is the first couple of nights, I just go up gradually like 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, like, and I sleep at 8,000 feet just because I feel like the marginal benefit to loss of sleep quality at that point is, you know, just not worth it. And Corey and I have, my coach have talked about that. Um, and it's sucking. It's basically providing less oxygen for you. Yeah, basically, it's taking oxygen out of the air. What mine does, it pumps in air that has less oxygen, and then it'll go like a little bit, like more altitude than you set it to. And then there's a little fan that sends in like oxygen and air from the outside, so that keeps fresh air flowing in. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So yeah, you don't die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but at, and then outside of that, other resources I have now, like I'm getting a massage every week. Like we have, you know, PTs at. The Under Armour campus, we have a full-time strength coach, Carrie. She's been great. Uh, that's been a big help to me. Now, is that uh, is, is that only available to Under Armour athletes, or does Carrie work outside of? Uh, of I, I mean, she does some consulting for college teams. I think she has some private clients, but her full-time gig is us and our 800 group here in Baltimore. So she yeah. uh, looks after us. She's It's very well organized. I have, like, a entire Google sheet with all of our exercises, like a – like we do a nine day training cycle when we're in between like a long period of races and it's laid out every day what we're supposed to do. Uh, I find that really helpful. Oh, so you don't have to go in and actually she observes you at the gym? When we do like true lift days, which is every third day, yeah, we meet up. But then there's like recovery circuits and other things that we do as well. Mobility, a lot of different exercises. And then other things to say oh like i have an agent i've like the ability to get into like some higher level meets and opportunities i may not have had in college so there's a lot of things that are kind of at my disposal to help me be the best so I can be. does under armor give you the agent like so how do you get from college to an under armor professional team okay so after the olympic trials uh cory basically contacted me and it was strange because the group was just starting so there was uh his mission right or is this dark night no, no, no. Dark, Dark Sky was already a group. The whole mission run thing, that started about a year ago. But basically, Corey was going to be the coach of a group in Baltimore. He reached out to me. My agent, Ray Flynn, I was connected to from college. He's good friends with my college coach, Marcus. They're both Irish. His daughter's actually on the team at Villanova. Um, basically, he helped me set up some summer races and ultimately like helped me get a contract. So... I chatted with Corey about this new Under Armour group. I was contacted by Atlanta Track Club as well. They were Mizuno at the time. Um, and the Reebok group, which was coached by the old Syracuse coach. Yeah. And I, I think that group is no longer now. I, I think, it, yeah, I think it's yeah. washed out. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was that weird, th like... Well, yeah, there was a transition. I think that uh, Reebok was sold off by Adidas. And I think that during that time, uh, it might have made it difficult to yeah, yeah. have other contracts. Yeah, so that was all interesting. But then, like, yeah, I basically finished up my summer season. I visited some friends in Seattle and did a road race in Yakima, Washington. Okay. Uh, and Corey and some of my teammates now were living in Boulder at the time before they moved here. I stopped over in Denver, went out there, stayed with a friend, and I remember having a meeting with Corey at the driving range in Boulder talking about the future and, like, I was just excited about kind of all the elements of uh, a new group and having the opportunity to be so close to headquarters. I, there were definitely some things I was nervous about. Like, I mean, footwear has improved within the company so much. Over yeah, these that's last what, few years that's and what will I was going to ask you. Like, so, like, that must have been a tough jump because I'm looking at Under Armour uh, even two years ago. They barely yeah. had a daily trainer out. They didn't have a super shoe. Mm-hmm. Like, if I was a pro athlete going there, I'd be, like, a little scared. I'm guessing that they showed you some protos and stuff like that to kind of be like, look, it's coming. But even even now, we're, you've been with the Under Armour program now for how long? It'll be a year and a half. year and a half. Okay, so I guess in, in that time, the shoes yeah. that, that have been available are, like, the Machina. Mm -hmm. Very heavy, kind of firm. Uh, the new Machina, I've really like actually that's what i'd wear on a is daily that basis. something that get, people can get a hold of now yeah yeah that's okay out. all right yeah. we haven't we haven't seen that here um really yeah I, i'm guessing <laughs> see and i feel like if they don't send us this year they there there's a reason usually yeah well the the hover line of trainers there's big things coming with that in the next year or two i've seen some prototypes of the new stuff and i mean it's going to be it's going to be a lot different and something that there's a lot of excitement about among the the pros. So, but also, you're, you you're I guess daily trainers would be important to you. 
A marathon yeah. shoe, less important, but a spike is super important, right? Sure. So were they showing you stuff and you yeah. were like, okay, if I come to the team, I know that I'll be able to have footwear that can compete at the world level? Yeah, basically uh, at that time, they were already putting out the first prototypes of like super shoes and spikes. And like basically immediately when I signed, I was getting what was called Project Lightspeed, which has led to this shoe that's being released on April 13th, the Velocity Elite. We were getting the first prototypes of that, which it was a pretty good start, but we were having these feedback meetings like pretty regularly and just being able to be involved in that like was part of what made me willing to take the leap and come to Under Armour. To have a voice in, in that production. Right, because I, I mean, you're obviously nervous about like, oh, can we do it or not? I'm, I mean, I'm looking at, at Under Armour. It's like, it's a big company that's investing a lot more in running. I'm sure they're going to be able to like, you, you would hope. Off. Yeah, yeah, no. And uh, like the shoes that we have now are great. And I'm really happy with the progress we made. But it was being able to be so involved to be here, have my voice be heard and ultimately be a part of this like exciting product that we have now, like all the improvements that have been made over the past few years and being able to be involved with all the great people that, you know, have been around Under Armour and have been brought in since they've had this like, you know, huge investment into to running these last few years. Um, yeah, that was honestly really exciting for me and spikes too like they understand they're signing like track athletes and like road like athletes who are going to do marathons road races so it's kind of two things going on at the same time do you feel like there's they've made progress in the track area which to us we wouldn't see because we'd be blind to that so yeah. like we are only concerned with daily trainers tempo trainers 100%, recovery yeah. and race day and i know sharon uh, one Sharon Lachetti won the New York City Marathon in an Under Armour shoe, mm -hmm. um, and we covered Jordan Trofe doing three marathons in three days, all under two hundred two hours and thirty minutes, yeah. which was, by the way, one of the most fun prizes I've <laughs> yeah, ever yeah. done in my life. <laughs> Hannah's like pouring a, like an ice trash can for him, uh -huh. getting him Olive Garden. It was so races, much yeah. fun, man. <laughs> um, but so, but still, it's like I've been waiting for the product and Under Armour, I know, I know that they're saying, Hey, there's a focus on running, but we're still waiting. Like, I don't sure. think the general running population knows about the shoes. So you're, I'm thinking that the spikes and the investment they're making in these, uh, speed in the track area, mm. you're saying that's paying off and they have stuff that can compete with the Nikes, the right. Even right. On's coming along. Yeah, so that and that's a good example too because I remember early on like hearing people in Boulder like, you know, they had similar growing pains of mm -hmm. like, you know, athletes are getting these prototypes like they're it takes a while to get the right iterations and then it takes even longer to get them out to the public and you know, that's kind of the way it goes and when you have all these professional athletes wanting to race in the best thing possible, you basically send out shoes get feedback and then when athletes are say like, "All right, this is good," like you know, this is something I want to race in, rush to get it certified, and then eventually you come out with something to the public. But going from like innovation to inline to getting it out, it does take time. So, so what, I guess then, I mean, I, I I know you're in the business management marketing side <laughs> for mm -hmm. your degree, but how do you see that playing out? Like, if you, so you're running career right now, you're competitive. Yeah. Okay. But you're investing your time at Under Armour and you believe in the product and, and the team behind the product. hundred percent. Yeah. And knowing that you have a degree in marketing and yeah. in business systems or what it was a business system, business analytics, business it's, analytics yeah, yeah. is your goal and desire to stay in the industry and to help a company like Under Armour and go into the shoe development side, or at least in yeah, I basically I have a lot of interest in, you know, the products that we're developing. I've made a lot of good relationships at Under Armour. I can see myself getting into the product marketing side, the like, all right, this is, you know, who we're building the shoes for. This is the feedback we're getting from our athletes. You know, this is the best product we can make and how we can, you know, put it out to the world. For me right now, what I'm doing is, you know, I've started volunteer coaching a couple of days a week at Hopkins. I like using my voice right now to you know kind of be a mentor and be you know playing a role in the running community that's unique to where i am right now if that makes sense being your own marcus yeah i guess i mean <laughs> like i'm not i'm not 
like the coaching perspective, I would have a lot to learn there, but like being a mentor, being, you know, somebody people look up to that, that's something I can always be, but it's unique for me right now as a professional athlete, somebody you see yeah. is competing on yeah. the highest level. I, I will tell it's, you just Thursday night, we have a run out of the headquarters here and Casey will show up sometimes. And I think I know that the other people see you as they're like, Oh, this is the coolest thing. We have a professional athlete who's coming to spend time with us mm. and run with us. So even when you're not trying to motivate or, you know, get somebody to that next level, yeah. just your presence sometimes is like, okay, this guy is out here. He's running with us. And you know, when you see uh, it's gotta be fulfilling for some of the young guys that we have come out to the group when they're out in front of you, because you're mm. doing your easy job because you've already done 10 workouts that day. <laughs> yeah. But they're like, yeah, look, I'm out in front of Casey Comer. Hey, I'm, and I'm really thankful for that group. Like when I first started coming to that group last summer, I got pretty banged up. I was hurt. I had to take some time off, came back, you know, started coming to this group. And I actually made, make jokes with Brandon that he's like my friendship agent. Like I've met <laughs> a lot of my friends through him. He's going to take 15% of all my friends. Nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, that group, I don't think they realize what they do for me. Like as a professional athlete, like I think it's just, it's rewarding to be whether a role model or, you know, somebody people just being somebody people admire in general and just having your presence be valuable in a unique period of your life, I think is really cool. So yeah, that's uh, well put. Um, speaking of which, so we know your nightly routine involves an altitude tent, but like, what is a typical day, day of, in the life of a professional runner? Like, what is a typical day for you? Wait, do we get the day or should we do a week? Cause like, you can do a nine day training cycle. Yeah, nine day. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> See, that's also interesting that you're on a nine day training cycle, not a week. Because he can be, because he's a professional yeah. athlete. Yeah, the day of the week doesn't matter as much to me. Like, you would never be able to do that in college if you're working, you know, a nine-to-five job, something like that. But, you know, we can, and we make adjustments based on life things that are going on. Like, uh, like if you've got a long day, like, uh, my girlfriend Lindsay and I are going up to girlfriend Billy this weekend yeah and you guys know her too <laughs> i do that's yeah. why that's why i say girlfriend uh, but sa like saturday will be a long day of walking around the city so we'll make some adjustments like i kind of switch lifts around and like gonna switch a double to the next day but in general uh day one is two runs i might do like an hour in the morning and a lift um based on what carrie's written then in the evening about five miles in the park i've been stealing uh, Brandon's roommate, Caleb has a little Husky that I've been yeah. running with a couple of <laughs> times. So take her, uh, running with a dog makes it easier. I think it yeah, depends on the dog for sure. Yeah. She can keep up. She does a good job. Then. So Tuesday's one run about 10 miles, decent run. I'll do some mobility, maybe some core day three is usually like a faster workout day on the track. Like, uh, yeah, something a little quicker, maybe like 400 to 800 reps, Something like that, like VO2 work. Then back to day four and five, which are similar to days one and two. Double and lift, 10-mile run. Day six, we've been doing quite a few double session days. So, like, two, like, tempo thresholdy workouts. That's the hot thing right now. That's it, what everyone's it is, talking yeah. about. Yeah, and, like, uh, Corey's gotten into this recently. We did this a lot in college, but we do lactate testing. Uh, if you've seen that, yeah. like, getting our fingers pricked. Yeah. Some people do it behind the ear. And you're looking for, you know, to get up into like the three to four range by the end of the workout, maybe a, a little bit less in the morning. So you're doing blood session. while you're working out? Yes. It's like a prick of the finger. Still. Yeah. Like it's Put our, the gloves yeah. on, you bring out the alcohol swabs, the <laughs> cotton swabs, the, the machine. Yeah, yeah, it's. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So when people say, oh, it's all the shoes that people are like, the reason why people are improving. I don't know how many times you saw people doing blood tests during yeah. workouts 10 years yeah. ago. Right. But. I More go to like the track. Cig cigarettes and pizza. Yeah, I go to the track in Flagstaff at NAU, and the trash can's full of like single use needles and <laughs> like strips and stuff. Yeah, that, that might be doping. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a measurement. But yeah, no, no. So the morning will be like a longer, maybe more towards the tempo side, a little bit slower, longer reps with less rest. So like this week, I did three by two miles, uh, like sub T, working up to temp, working up to threshold with seventy five seconds rest. Basically do nothing from nine to five. I call it my reverse work day. I like that. So out in the morning, nothing. And then evening we did 12 by 800. So a little bit faster where you're getting I, yeah. uh, a little bit more rest. So the your 
working for a little over two minutes, resting for a minute in between. What is you, so? I think all of us have favorite and least favorite workouts when it comes to running. Like, I don't mind. You give me a twenty mile run, I'm like fine. I can motor in, just keep going. But I get nervous about speed work because I'm like, okay, that's a measurement of you know my stuff. So sure. I have to calm myself down. But between your different workouts, what's the one that you love the most and the one that you dread the most? Okay. <laughs> so the the workout, and I did it once this winter, that I love the most is I did four sets of four by 300. Okay, uh, so speed work. Yeah, yeah. So the sets are basically working from 3K pace down to mile pace, like, like by set. So the first set might be, you know, 46, the last set's close to 42, and it's 100 jog, nice neat, like 40 to 45 seconds in between reps. And then the rest between sets is like three, four, five minutes as you go. So like you get faster and the rest between sets is a little bit more as you go. And it gets, it so gets pretty like, yeah, tough, right. but it's uh So that's when fun. you like. That's like a 1500 mile specific workout that okay. I really like. Yeah. What do you dread? Like when you know it's on your, you see it on your schedule and you're like, oh. uh, I would probably say hill reps. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm with you on that which I, is and that, that, honestly that's another like speed power workout kind of but like i just it's just tough okay, that's like, perfect because i like hill reps ugh. because here's the difference like if you tell me i have to run you know 800s and this would be your jogging pace but at 615s or something yeah. like that that to me is terrifying i'm like mm -hmm. i got because it's if i i know if i've hit it or not mm -hmm. hill reps i can be like just go hard on a hill rep and so my yeah. training has just changed to effort based anyway. Like I'm just like, mm. sure. If it hurts, you're doing it right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, yeah. So for a hill, that I would think that would take some pressure off if you're doing hill reps that you don't have to worry about hitting certain. Yeah, but I think, I think I thrive on like, this is how the workout is prescribed. Like this is something you should be able to do. And if I can go even faster than that, and I feel like I've done it, at least in these hard workouts, when you have confidence. a day that's specifically like physiological, like a threshold day where you're testing and stuff, I'm not worried about like going faster than I'm supposed to. But on a hard workout day, I want to feel like I can like kill this and like, you know, it, it whatever. Whereas at hills, you don't really get that reward as much. <laughs> you know, you can measure out the hills and, and all, but like, Every hill is different in grade. and But I feel know. like that you can't, well, I I'm not going to try to change your mind about it. But <laughs> I feel like with the hills where I notice it is, if I start hill workouts at the beginning of like training and yeah. how difficult it is, and then as I get more time in and do more hill workouts or, or stuff, that that thing that used to be difficult is not quite as difficult. Yeah, but you can get that on the track, and it's like very like you can just see it. In <laughs> you can the measure like it you know exactly what's going on. I, I never get on. Right? Track. I use the annex. The the annex. Oh yeah, that's right by track. my house. I do that all the time too. Yeah. I was gonna say, where do you? What track do you use? Uh, so Under Armour actually recently built a track in. Is Port it Covington. open? Uh, it is for us. Okay. And for our employees, <laughs> and I think the plan is eventually to have public hours as well. But I wouldn't know that for sure. I mean, you we're know, gonna screw it up for you. We're gonna leave yeah. like goose on the track, and you know, <laughs> the security is surprisingly pretty tight there. We'll be we'll be running in the first lane. <laughs> yeah. Um How many people are on your team? So we have close to ten now. Okay. I think yeah. The women's team is definitely still growing. Uh, we have three, and they're definitely looking to add some more soon. Are you uh, trying out, The maybe? men's team. I'm uh, definitely not. We have six. So I guess we have nine total at the moment. Okay. But definitely still growing, especially on the women's side. And, and Under uh, Armour has different teams. Correct. Explain that. Yes. So in Baltimore, we have the distance group, which is mainly like mile and up. So mile, steeple, 5K, 10K. Uh, and the 800 group, which is mainly running the 800 meters. Okay. Um, so we see each other a lot. Uh, we're in the gym together. Carrie is the strength coach for both teams. But ultimately, like, we kind of train different styles. Uh, a lot of what they do is a little bit more power-based. Sure. Uh, they do a little bit more on that side. Was, we're doing a lot of uh, kind of like aerobic work, working down to, for me, the mile or 1500. And then the Flagstaff group is kind of a mix uh, I mean, there are a lot of athletes that want to go train out there because it's a great altitude destination. One of the big reasons why people love training there is because you can drop down an altitude pretty quickly if you want to go do a hard session. Um, so they, yeah, they have all kinds of athletes. Sharon Lachetti obviously won the New York City Marathon. Neil Gurley was just second to 
Jakob Ingebrigtsen, one of the Jakob Ingebrigtsen. They've got a lot of great athletes as well. So those are the three groups, all named Mission Run, but Dark Sky out there. And then. <laughs> so is that where you're going for? You said you're going to Altitude Camp. So after Boston weekend, so I'm running the road mile, which is exciting because I will be in Boston. Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to wear the like the new Velocity Elite that's going to oh, be released sweet. April 13th, two days before that. So it'll be fun to wear that. Um, there's a road mile Saturday before Marathon Monday. Yeah, round the block at the finish line, which is pretty sweet. Uh, I'll do that and then, yeah, go out for four weeks to altitude is the, camp. Is the road mile set up for only pros or is that going to be, can any, like, is there? Honestly, I haven't done it before, so I'm not sure. I, I think so. It's definitely, if it's open to the public, there's definitely a pro wave. That's like, Well, yeah, yeah but I don't, sure. in a mile, if they could probably lap people <laughs> if it's a, if it's a around the block no it's yeah i I feel like i've only seen pros before but maybe it is for everyone because it's kind of cool to be able to finish at the marathon finish line without having to (laughs) run 26 26. miles yeah Yeah. Uh, like it would be so sick to like i I get the win in these new shoes and i'm like celebrating and i'm just feeling like all right like i mean i ran hard but i can recover a heck of a lot faster than like if sharon goes out there and wins (laughs) the 20 26 miles and she's dead the rest of the day oh yeah she's running right (laughs) Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's going to be a sick Are you going to stay and watch the marathon? Uh, well, since I'm going out to camp and we're kind of staying in the middle of nowhere, I got to get guys to drive 70 minutes to pick me up. Oh, wow. I'm leaving the next day. Plus, I think the airport will be an absolute cluster on Monday. Uh, I mean, I'll definitely be tuning in, but yeah, I got to I gotta get out of there. So we're, we're interviewing Kara Gatcher soon, and she in her book, she talks a lot about the uh, – doping and stuff going on to give that extra edge. Like, like you said, it's maybe not always the shoe. Um, have you ever experienced Like, do you, have you seen anything or have you ever been in a situation where you feel like you may have lost out to somebody who was, uh, enhancing their performance? Mm. I think the way, the way, I view it as I try to be the eternal optimist. Like I was reading the lap count, Kyle Merber's news, newsletter recently, and that's kind of how he put it. Like I think it's, like he said, it's impossible to enjoy the sport any other way. Like if you're constantly doubting everyone that's out there and whether it's out of jealousy or whether you think that you saw something or heard something that somebody did, you just kind of have to assume the best for the sake of the sport. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to have that attitude. Like sometimes you, you go out and you feel like you've done everything you can and it should be enough and it's not. Like do you know people that like you constantly beat in college that all of a sudden are just. Not really. I I mean, there, there are certainly some like rapid improvements out there that make you, that make you like think a little bit, but I try not to, you know. I try not to think too much about it and let the system do what it's supposed to do. So for the most part, you think it's a pretty healthy environment for people that are playing by the rules. Yeah. I, I just force myself to think that, you know, like (laughs) I, I didn't, and I, I do think that there are a lot of great athletes that are clean. Yeah. I, I think that there are some people out there that just like are so pessimistic. They think everyone's dirty. And not only do I think that's bad for the sport, I think that's wrong. I think it's incorrect. Uh, I think that, you know, there's definitely people doing like gray area stuff with like therapeutic use exemptions and whatnot. But again, like I have to be, you know, optimistic and for the sake of my sport, just continue to, you know, continue to fight hard and trust that other people are playing by the rules. Yeah. At my level, it doesn't matter because it doesn't like I'm not going to win and and I'm not even going to get in a place where sponsor dollars or, or contracts or performance is based i would think as a professional athlete it's a lot more stressful to because you know that like that's one of the things she brought up like your career is based on your performance and your performance is against other athletes Mm. and this uh, just seems so stressful to have to even entertain that that's a possibility for for the uh yeah i mean i think that there are some people out there that are more desperate than others i mean i feel like under Armour's taken really good care of me and um you know I have a lot of a lot of support I don't feel in any way desperate to try to find an edge like that I mean I'm going to continue to be the best that I can be and when I feel like I've given it all I have I'll move on with my life I'll do something else but there are certainly people out there that'll you know find every advantage they can whether it's within the rules or not 
Yeah, well, Megan, let's let's end this on a positive note <laughs> since I brought it down. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, well, um, I don't think we got like your favorite Under Armour shoes, like for easy day, for fast days. Like, give us the lineup. Well, so the the Machina Three is the one that I wear for like easy okay. days. That's my typical trainer. Uh, I think they've made a lot of improvements to that in the last year and a half, and that's why I've kind of transitioned to that as my everyday trainer. And you know, it's kept me healthy. And at at my level, like. And not to be like a gatekeeper of running or anything like that, but I'm more thinking about like the performance shoes and stuff. As long as I have a trainer that keeps me healthy, that is perfectly fine. Cause then I can switch into, you know, the Velocity Elite, which is my favorite shoe. That is the shoe that I honestly do like all my workouts in. Anything that's slower than mile pace, where I would like switch into spikes all the way up to like a long run, which I would just wear trainers for. It's just a really nimble super shoe. I mean, it doesn't have that extreme stack height that a lot of shoes out there have. So, I mean, some people may be looking for that. But for me, I like to be explosive. Do you use it almost like a daily daily trainer? Not as a daily trainer, but, uh, you know, for, like, all my workouts and stuff, I feel like it, you know, it keeps its bounce longer than some other shoes that I tried in college. Uh, And I'm good friends with one of the guys in the lab, and I'm always (laughs) trying to bounce ideas off him. But I feel like I've put in, you know, 150 miles on some of these and they like hold up pretty well but yeah any surface i I feel like it does well so that to me is like the big thing right now and conveniently that shoe is coming out on april 13th (laughs) (laughs) i feel like hannah's prepped and ready (laughs) really drive home the velocity (laughs) but yeah i i I will say for me the velocity elite feels similar to uh, endorphin speed which is a socket issue that people adore and do use for daily training like people would mm-hmm. use it 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 was meant to be kind of like a step down from their um race day shoe mm-hmm. but people use it like now it's like a plated shoe that people use for all their runs so i could see the same uh with the velocity elite yeah and i think that you know that's not to say in the future they won't go more extreme to the end that some uh brands are doing but i this shoe for me is a great versatile shoe, uh, and I'm excited to wear it on April 15th in the in the mile up in Boston. Yeah, and I don't mean to say that it's not something that you'd want to race in necessarily, but um, you know, it's it is a lower stack, a little less cushion than some sure. of the super shoes. But looks like in the future, like you're kind of hinting at, uh, we might even see a more aggressively stacked uh, version of the shoe. But that's not to take anything away from the April 15th launch of the Velocity April Elite. 13th <laughs> launch. April 15th race. Okay, they, they April 15th. Out there. Yeah, yeah, we got cool. the, the bright green colors. and uh, What's April yeah. 15th? That's a, the one-mile race the in mile Boston. The mile in Boston, oh, okay. yeah. So oh, when you're... So we're, we're the 16th or 17th? The, the race marathon's is on Monday, 17th. 17th. Okay, yeah. Ugh. Um, When you're... I guess for any race, are you going in with the mentality of I want to win or I'm going to win? So mostly, yes. I think sometimes you have to be realistic out there and say like... Like your Ingebrigtsen line. Like you go to US... Like if I went to USA's right now, if Outdoor USA's was right now, I would say, look, I've got to be top three to make the team. I don't think I can beat Jared Nagus right now. I just don't. I mean, will I think I can beat him by July? I hope so. But like, you know, you, you got to go out and be, you know, you give yourself the best chance of success if you set, you know attainable goals and you have a plan to achieve them if i go out there thinking you know i'm gonna run the world record right now like i'm probably not gonna do that but it's also (laughs) it's dependent on a lot of factors like and i guess there's less in a shorter distance race but you know it's like a marathon you could go out and somebody dnfs like the chances are i will beat one of the pros at boston because he'll dnf yeah and <laughs> there, there's a kid at hopkins he's a he's a freshman and he was the last guy in to d3 nationals in the 5k and he's like he's like asking for advice i was like i was talking to my roommates about this i didn't say this to him but i was like well there's no way this kid's gonna get last there's always somebody who's like hurt or got sick <laughs> yeah. or something who's just gonna run terrible yeah. so don't worry about that you know just mix it up and and do the best you can have a plan go out there execute it and you know if you're if you have goals that are achievable and you've put the work in to to get it done, then you can get it done. So do you know the lineup for April 15th? Like, do you know who you're running against? Yes, I've seen it. There are definitely a few names I recognize. Johnny Gregoric won last oh. year. I know he's there. Okay. Uh, ben Veach, who's in the Under Armour. That's right. A6, Johnny Gregoric. Yeah. 
Yeah, they don't have many pros, to be honest, uh, in, in distance running. Yeah. On the female marathon side, yeah, they're pretty stacked. Yeah, I mean, I just think about like athletes I see on the track, and yeah. I don't see a whole lot. They have some sprinters now, but yeah, I wonder. Yeah. I wonder why that is. I don't know. I don't know. We love their discus thrower Val. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. She's like a living superhero. <laughs> yeah, she is crazy. Yeah. Um. Uh, all right. Cool. So we'll be in Boston. Hopefully, we can watch that race, and we'll be out there cheering for you. Yeah, um, should be very spectator friendly because it's a couple of loops. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. You want us to, you know, hold a Gatorade for you or anything? <laughs> uh, I don't think yeah, they take influence. I don't, know if they have a wa- I don't know if they have a water stop, you know, for the two, mile. two minutes into the mile. I don't know, man. You guys need to hydrate. <laughs> That'd be hilarious, though, if they had, like, a little goose station. <laughs> yeah, and also be at the Baltimore 10K April 8th around here. All right. Uh, Wait, what's the Baltimore 10K? Are you talking about the like, Soul of the City? Soul of oh. City, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to, I mean, it'll just be... I'll just be out there running. I don't think I'll like race it, but I'll be handing out awards. So if anybody oh, that's local cool. uh, is around. Jeremy yeah, Ardenoy, yeah. did you hear that? He's <laughs> 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 like an annual. <laughs> but yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, definitely we'll check you out the mile in Boston. That'll be really cool. Um, and I'm guessing that's early morning. I think it's close to noon. Oh, I'm, noon. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure it's later because the 5k they've got a 5k which is honestly a little bit bigger it's a, a yeah. little bit deeper field but that is that's in the morning that definitely has people in because i ran the 5k last year yeah and let me yeah. tell you some people this is a tip <laughs> do not line up what you think your pace will be line up towards the front i lined up at like six minute something uh last year and people i had to like for the first mile i was dodging walkers and and having to weave in and out did not end up running <laughs> anything in the sixes after that but uh yeah it was a get up towards the front <laughs> pro tip pro tip <laughs> oh yeah it's a good time though cool all right all right <laughs>